Hello. Uh, so I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Rolando Henry. I work for the Ontario Digital Service. Um, this will be my little discussion about uh, DevOps. I realize I might have been a little ambitious with my alliteration when I came up with my uh, title for this. And so after seeing a couple of the other talks, and uh, I think they're going to be going a little more deeper into some of the things that I will be talking about. So this is more kind of a, uh, for someone kind of learning how to scuba dive, uh, deep dive, so kind of like snorkeling in a pool at a resort kind of style. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I work for the Ontario Digital, Digital Service. I've been in government for about eight years now. Um, I like patterned shirts, and I sometimes democratically get them chosen for me uh, the next day. And uh, I have a cat. His name is Lord Perkins. He's quite good. And sometimes when I work from home, he helps me solve some problems. Um, so basically, you know, what is DevOps other than kind of a portmanteau of development and operations? And really the idea is it's kind of a philosophy and kind of culture um, about how to develop. Uh, you know, in keeping in mind that you want to be kind of agile and um, agile, and you know you want to release your code faster, get more you know feedback faster, kind of resolve issues faster, and uh, you know be a little bit more efficient about releasing your code uh, with automation, you know continuous integration, delivery and deployment. And uh, so, you know, there's this kind of feedback loop where you get to, um, you know, you kind of plan, you create, uh, you know, you build, you test, deploy it, you know, kind of monitor it, and then take that feedback to back to the developers um, to kind of help them, you know, fix those problems. And, you know, that DevOps culture where you're kind of, the developers are working directly with, you know, those operations people, you know, you make the developer's life easier and you kind of make the, the operator's life easier too. Um, you know, the last thing is, as kind of a sysadmin, you know, when a developer comes and is like, hey, can you release my code? And you're like, okay, how does it work? And then you try to do it and, you know, there's a long list of things you have to configure or change. Uh, you know, and this, this process of kind of just having that, you know, integration with a, a, the operator and the developer just makes you know life a lot easier. You know when you think of um, the development process, a lot of times you can kind of get that. Oh well, you know it worked on my sandbox, or when I was working on it locally, it worked perfectly. So you know it should be working. You know when we deployed it to stage or or to prod. And so this idea of DevOps and this culture is to kind of make that whole process consistent and you know iterable. And so that when you commit some code and have it deployed either automatically or have the systems do it, you know, the expectation that it should work will be there and you don't have that kind of, you know, oh, it, it worked here, but why isn't it working here? Um, so for local development, uh, you know, as a DevOps, I kind of try to help our developers um, work better. Um, there's been some other talks already about uh, Drupal VM by my colleague Nick, Nick, who, you know, Drupal VM is a dream, as he says, uh, which is, you know, and, and Drupal VM uses Vagrant and Ansible, and from a DevOps perspective, that can be actually really great because that Vagrant image can mimic, you know, your stage and production environments almost exactly, and the, the way Drupal VM works is actually with Ansible, which is a whole bunch of playbooks that kind of automate and codify the entire build process, which we can then actually use those exact playbooks and rebuild that in the same environment or even package up that you know, image and use that as well. Another one where I think Derek is actually doing a, a deep dive on Lando right now, uh, and I approve of the name Lando because that's actually another nickname of mine, um, but I haven't actually had a chance to work with it. And that's more Docker-based, 
And that can be really great as well um, if your production environment or your staging environment is already using Docker. Uh, Lando is really just a wrapper for uh, Docker Compose and Docker makes things simple. And you know, if you can get your developers to kind of do things that are in the production environment, but in a simpler way that they don't need all the nitty gritty of all the Docker setup, then that can make you know the system in life as easy as well because you're basically just kind of taking that code, popping it into an image, and and doing that same thing. And so it keeps that uh, development uh, release cycle, you know, consistent, and uh, and it, um, you know, you can always do it and expect the same results. Um, another great thing uh, about uh, kind of where things are going, we've seen a lot of great tools about continuous integration and deployment. Is that you know developers can push some code and see results in you know whatever tool they're using and instead of you know making a command it's like hey can you uh, launch this or put it right away even before it kind of gets there they can get that feedback um, you know we at the Ontario Digital Service we're using GitLab so all our projects are uh, in GitLab and as DevOps we try to you know also mentor our developers and kind of help them use good, good Git pro, um, processes, uh, like Git flow we use, um, and we're kind of, you know, it becoming a little more agile as well. Like we're fairly new at some of this stuff, and kind of that feedback loop that I showed before, in a meta way, also kind of applies to DevOps, in that DevOps we're kind of building new features, helping our developers, getting feedback and kind of putting it back in. And now we're kind of enforcing more of that kind of CI, CD, continuous integration and deployment uh, for projects coming in. And uh, I'll show you a, an example GitLab um, file that we use for one of our projects that Nick is working on. Um, and I'll do a, let me just, I don't know if you can really see that. Uh, so I'll just step kind of through this here. So basically, and we've seen this similar things with Travis and Circle CI. Uh, with our GitLab, you can do it's it's very it's great in that you can run just scripts. You can set it up to run as like a you know, Docker in Docker, so more like, so it can either work kind of like Jenkins where you can just run scripts, or you can kind of set it up to be kind of like CircleCI Travis where it's it's running um, based in Docker. And for our Drupal project, you know, this kind of round of work, before it was, we would commit some code, we would tag it, and then we would take that code and deploy it, but we would do like the the composer update, the theme node build as part of the deployed process. Um, but in kind of this round of our continuous integration, we actually do the composer uh, updates as a uh, part of the process uh, stage and the the node build. So, you know, instead of in the deploy, you know, some composer um, uh, dependency fails or something with node fails or having to worry about which version of node is on those boxes, you know, a developer can, you know, do some work and see those uh, errors early um, that they may not have seen on their local machine. Because sometimes, you know, you can install a module locally, but forget to commit something. And then when you do the actual commit and it goes, and it's like, well, where's this dependency? Um, so now we, you know, that compose install, uh, you know, we can use an image that's kind of fine-tuned for just that PHP portion and then do a node build where, you know, just use a specific version of node. Um, and then what we do right now is we kind of package that up kind of like an artifact and put that up uh, to our code deploy. And then that gets, that code in, during our actual deploy gets pulled down. We do a, you know, the actual, um, 
up DB and all that as part of the deploy, but that's the only part that we kind of have to worry about. We don't have to worry about all those additional levels of uh, waiting for dependencies to install. It's all kind of prepackaged. Where did my presentation go? <laughs> well, too many windows. It is gone. Okay. This is me trying to use Google or this Google Slides, but it was there. Let me just. Uh, there it goes. Anyone? There it is. No. Sorry, guys. It was. Oh, see, this is when I like split the uh, the screen. I'm like looking at my screen and not seeing it. Uh, okay, great. So let me go back to this. Um, so in GitLab, um, each commit has a pipeline, um, and you can set that CI pipeline to only work on certain things. Um, so say the a testing portion, you can have it do on every single commit. The building of stage credentials can be done on develop, not master, or on release branches. So you can kind of give it uh, you know, certain parameters. And you can have a, a manual um, deploy for only master or just tags. So you'll see a lot of um, you know, control in that GitLab, which is great for for system, or DevOps, so you know certain stages of that development process, you know, are, is very automated, and then certain steps where we may not want code to go directly to prod just yet, where you know there may be additional steps that as DevOps we need to do. We can do it a manual way. Um, it just kind of provides that level of, of control. Um, a lot of you know that automation is about, uh, you know, you think, okay, we've, we've come from the days of, uh, in, in Ontario Digital Service, where we would go on, you know, when we wanted to do a deploy, we would literally go onto the boxes, get pull, you know, do all the setup, and it's like, this is kind of ridiculous, so let's start automating this. But then, you know, you go down kind of a rabbit hole of, well, I can, Automate it this way, and certain tools at the time. Let's, let's try it with you know, with Salt or with Puppet, and then you start going, and then you've spent you know a good amount of your your day automating something that you could have done, you know, really quick. But the idea is, you don't want to always go onto those boxes and do it. And so, over the years, uh, we've kind of changed our. Our processes, and we're you know really getting in line with this new kind of DevOpsy kind of culture, and a lot of the automation tools that are already out there. Like we were writing our own Bash scripts and Python scripts to do a lot of stuff that you know the CI does and what Ansible will do. Um, you can't really see that. Okay, one sec here. That is our uh, so. Right now, we're also using Ansible to um, to deploy. And let me try this again. So when you're kind of like a math nerd, and you kind of just make it worse. Okay. So basically, what's nice about Ansible is uh, it's all kind of based on modules and, and steps. And it's very, you know, do this step. And it's kind of self-explanatory, like how you write it. You know, you kind of give a comment. This does this. This will do this. And, you know, you basically just run a, I run a little command. Or we're starting to experiment with AWX, which is an open source version of uh, what's called Tower 
for Ansible that basically you can create these playbooks and literally just push a button and it can run you know these really long playbooks or uh, and you can configure them by you know adding tags to certain steps say like okay on these machines do this step um, or only do this portion or if something fails it'll go back but because we've gone in and fixed a certain thing you know start here um, specifically with our Drupal 8 deploys now is in our automation nine times out of ten it works great you know the pull down the code do the you know Drush updb just in case, do a Drush CIM. Um, for our deploys, we, we copy it, and then once the configuration is kind of changed, we just symlink, so that's kind of the, you know, the live version. Uh, but every now and then, there will be, you know, a, you need to run updb twice, or CIM twice, or just, you know, something kind of craps out. Um, and that's, so Nick and I will sometimes, when we do a deploy, is kind of sit together, and kind of go through, um, but you know, most of the time now it's you know you can give it to kind of a junior. They just go in, just ask for the tag, it goes, and you know, as this is kind of going, and again in my kind of programming mind, I want to automate a wave, saying, oh, you need additional steps. How can we add an additional layer to say I'm going to do a deploy, but I'm also going to do these additional steps to kind of help out um, that automated process. Uh, which kind of leads to this, this general problem of, you know, you want to do one thing and you could probably do it really fast, but you also want to set up a way so that the next time it's actually asked, you know, it's it's automated. Um, this a lot of my day is kind of is like, oh, I'm doing a lot of the same thing. So let me find a way to do it. But then you know, you spend a lot of time uh, writing these scripts. Um, another kind of portion of of that DevOps feedback loop is you know monitoring this code uh, that goes out. And right now we're uh, starting to use uh, the Elastic Stack um, and sending like log metrics, um, log metrics like nginx, uh, PHP. And we're sending metric information like about how the instances are running, um, and we're also actually sending packet information, which can lead to you know some interesting uh, debugging. I'll do a demo soon. Um, for Drupal specifically, um, you can set up, you can even send watchdog logs to Elasticsearch, either setting up a watchdog to go to syslog, and then that syslog would automatically get uh, picked up by Filebeat. Um, there's a module called JSON log where you can kind of take those uh, Drush logs and you can you know, set up a filter, say only do warnings and errors, and it prepackages it as JSON, and then that just gets picked up, and you can do more analysis on that. Uh, I'll do a quick demo here. So <clears throat> this is uh, kind of our production environment and the kind of basic Nginx logs. Uh, let me put screen this. And so you can basically set a uh, you know, time period. So this is for the last seven days. You can kind of see where uh, traffic is coming from, but what's kind of nice about this is, you know, you can also see kind of where the errors are coming in, and it's like, oh, well, this is, you know, a significant spike in errors. And so I can go like that and kind of drill down uh, to that time period and, you know, find out, okay, there's obviously something weird happened on the long weekend. Um, going down to those Nginx logs. And uh, you can find the actual actual error. So this looks like some upstream. Um, you can 
So we're going to just look at response codes. Oops. That should show something. Uh, let me just. So we see a lot of 404s. Uh, and you know you can see um, because it's Ontario.ca, it's also used for like the actual LDAP, so we get a lot of this auto discover. But what's interesting um, is we also have machine learning on our Nginx blog or logs and we have this thing called Anomaly Explorer, and you know we can get down to showing basically, you know, it will look at your Nginx logs and say, oh, these are, you know, kind of events that are out of, you know, normal, um, normal range. And then you can even go and you can explore that. And what we found actually is during that time, someone was actually spoofing a 10 dot uh, IP address and hitting, was it this one? Some weird, um, there was just thousands of these, just hashed sites to the point of, you know, normal traffic on a Sunday, you know, less than 10,000 hits to, you know, over 50,000. Um, and so a lot of DevOps and a lot of my day sometimes is just kind of coming in and taking a look at what has, what has kind of gone on with the, the site, um, but, or if like a site's been slow, we can go in and look at this information and kind of debug you know, was it, uh, was it PHP? Was it Nginx? Um, sorry, this one. You know, and you can even get down to uh, MySQL performance. Um, I don't know why nothing's coming up there. I have good thing I have backup of uh, images, but um, so you know you can look at the logs, and then also that the metric information about the actual instances that we deal with are there. Um, you know, down to the information about um, you know what kind of instances they are, which region. Um, this is the MySQL kind of performance. You can show errors, um, how much of you know that throughput there is there. And, you know, to uh, getting the developers access to those dashboards as well, uh, they can go in and kind of see information about, um, you know, if there was 500s, was it something that was caused by like a release? Because it's all, you know, based on time, you can kind of see, oh, you know, I, I did a release and all of a sudden there's a, you know, huge spike in 500 errors. Um, we can give that feedback back to the developers or, or they can see it themselves going through this, uh, these dashboards that we're starting to, you know, empower our developers with ways or our tools as well. And so there's that, you know, with all that monitoring and, and kind of empowering the developers, we can help plan, you know, their sprints and what they need to develop or, or fix on their, um, you know, their projects. Sort of it for now, but uh, do you have any questions on some of the tools that we use? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of Elk. Yeah, so that's you're, you're replacing the L with another letter. Can yeah, you, so it's I think the Elk was Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Cabana, and so Cabana is the visualization portion of that stack. Elasticsearch was the search portion, portion. and uh, before uh, there's a service or application called Logstash where Basically, you just pump everything to Logstash. You create these pipelines to kind of um, enhance the data. But now, um, 
Elastic has these things called beats, which are subsets and kind of predefined pipelines. So the file beat specifically only looks at file logs and it has modules. So there's like an Nginx module um, and you can look at, you know, uh, I'll show you. Uh, like drop rates. So you're basically, uh, you know, splitting things into categories. Like yeah, exactly. So um, the categories and modules. Um, metric beat is specifically just for metrics. That's all it's looking at. Uh, packet beat looks at um, packets, and it has uh, specific modules. Like you can look at, like you know, uh, Postgres, MySQL right. traffic. So Mongo. these are all part of Logstash, or it's... they're kind of separate, and you can even technically use beats like so every instance we have has a little a beat daemon running that kind of processes that and right now they're just kind of going directly to Elasticsearch because our infrastructure isn't that large per se um, but if you have like a lot of services especially if you're on Kubernetes or uh, OpenShift and you have a lot of containers you can send those beats to say a log stash service that can then have like a, um, a queue and so it ensures that all information goes, um, or you know, it just helps the processing. You can add additional metadata. Um, you can say, how do you, like, how do you install? Like, do you like sudo apt install the engine? Yeah, um, like, pretty much. No, okay. so filebeat. Say you go sudo okay. install filebeat, and filebeat modules enable nginx, and it just knows uh, where nginx is, what kind of information kind of comes through. It adds and it processes everything, and then cool. Elasticsearch itself self has um, these ingest pipelines that basically like do the GOIP lookup. They, um, you know, can enhance that data. Um, and Elastic itself also has uh, a Grok or debugger where you can say you have custom log messaging um, that you know isn't covered by any of those modules. You can put a sample message and kind of the idea of what you want, and it'll tell you, you know, how, how to group that information. Um, or like, you know, this is a timestamp, this is the code, um, et cetera. I actually had to add an additional um, pattern for PHP FPM logs, because right now there isn't a kind of a, a module specifically for PHP FPM, but the logs are always there and they're fairly consistent, so you can just be like, if it's PHP FPM, just apply these kind of rules, and that information goes. And another thing that we're going to be working on soon with a lot of our APIs um, is called APM, Applica Application Performance Metrics, which basically is a little server that runs, that sends information to the, the stack. But then there's a, uh, a node module that you install on like an Express app that kind of, um, what's the word, instruments all your files. And so as you're running like any API call, it'll go in and show you the how well it did, but then also the window of say, it took this much time to call my SQL, it took this much time to cause, you know, talk to Mongo uh, and the return response. And if there's an error, it actually goes and you can click on the error and it will open it'll show you the exact stack and line of code where that happened. I would show you now that right now we're not actually using it, but we want to in our... So that's APM? APM, yeah, Application Performance Metrics. Okay. And it was a separate company, uh, but Elastic uh, procured them, like, or uh, bought them. And it, it's really cool. And so there's, um, for a PHP API, uh, I think there's one for PHP, there's one for uh, Ruby, uh, there's one for, for JavaScript. And the idea is, send as much as possible to Elasticsearch so you're, you can send like everything so that if something does happen, you just close that, like choose a window of time and you can drill down to like, you know, line of code um, type information. Any other questions? I can keep asking. Yeah, yeah go for it. <laughs> I mean, a uh, DevOps discussion. You know. uh, so one thing we've been looking at setting up for some of our stuff is Prometheus for monitoring stuff. Yeah. Do you, do you have, have you played with that? Any no, we, that? we had talked about Prometheus. For metrics? For metrics. And it, it, there's some overlap of, of what they kind of do. Yeah, that's... Yeah, um, but we... 
you know, being kind of government, we kind of have to watch out like for a lot of paid services that we kind of do. And so this Elasticsearch, we're already on AWS, and so we're using um, Elastic Cloud through AWS Marketplace. So it's already being applied to a subscription service that we pay for or are billing. So we got to experiment and play with it, and we're we you know we started small. Like our team was you know six to twelve people before, so a lot of it was can we learn it and do as much open source free kind of things that we can do. But we did talk about using Prometheus. Um, but I think I was like really big into Elasticsearch and kind of still am. So it just kind of went. Uh, so I was just looking this up actually because of the overlap. And on the fact page for Prometheus, it says, hey, how do I get logs in there? And then it says, don't use the, something like the upstack. Yeah. So, I so yeah, it's, and I think there's even, I think you can actually send some Prometheus data into Elasticsearch as well. Right. And so there's a small overlap there. I just find it's just nice to have everything in one spot. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, that's, it looks like that's where it's going because people don't want to have five separate tools for all this. Yeah, stuff, right? and I mean, you can, you can go, you know, fairly deep into that and create, you know, logging, you know, say you do a git commit, you can send information to Elasticsearch about the CI pipeline Right. And so, you know, if, if all of a sudden there was a spike in 500 errors, you know, you go down and you look at your logs and it's like, oh, there was, you know, this pipeline went here and during that time, this one machine, you know, there was a CPU spike and then you can go drill down and it's like, oh. Yeah, well, just before there was a commit. Yeah, so and, and actually even in, um, even in here, some of the dashboards, there's like SSH logins. So you can actually see if there was, you know, an attempt to log in or if someone did log in that you didn't actually notice and you can see pseudo commands and it's like, you can see the whole trail of everything that happens on your infrastructure. That's great. Yeah. Thanks.